I'll, I'll change it. And, and that's where we start. So this is four or five years ago or so. But before, before I talk, uh, talk any, any more about this and, and other stories I have for today, I would like to know who we have in the room because um, this is sort of a flexible presentation. I'm going to be changing some of the content based on who do we have in here. Um, so a couple of quick show of hand questions. How many of you are working for a, a vendor, working for Drupal customers? That would be most of you. Excellent. How many of you are working on the customer side? Very few. Okay. Uh, what about in-house team? Okay. To be expected, I guess. Um, so how many of you would consider yourself being completely new to Agile? Okay. Uh, how many of you have some experience, but not completely Agile? Most of you. Okay, great. Uh, what about who can say it's like everything you do in your organization is always done by using Agile? Okay, quite a nice spread. I did the same, uh, same talk in, in DrupalCon uh, Amsterdam, and um, basically the room looked pretty similar in there as well. Um, so I'm expecting quite a few questions, um, usually from, from vendor, vendor side, there's a lot of different questions on like, uh, you know, how's, how's this and that working. So I'm doing the questions a bit differently from most sessions. We are going to be using Twitter for this. And I have my colleague Steve here, um, who's going to moderate them for us. So I'm going to actually take these questions in the middle of the session as well. Um, so we're just using hashtag selling agile. So this will help us to, to pick the most interesting questions that are specific for, for these topics and, and, and so on and, and so on. I have to jump out of my presentation for one second. I'll be right back you, back with you. Just that I'm missing your, your questions and stuff here. Oh, fine. I'll just manage without them. Um, so um, the story today uh, is really in, in three different parts. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about, like, you know, everybody really loves Agile and, and it's great. Uh, I'm going to talk about why it is so difficult to sell. What's, what's the, the deal behind it? Um, afterwards, I'm going to talk about, like, more specific details on how to sell, sell Agile. And I have, I have, like, real stories, like, how to do it a number of different examples on, on how, to, how to actually go about and, and sell it. And I'm going to wrap it up by talking a bit about what if the customer still comes back and tells you like, no, no, but I need to have fixed everything. So I, I do have three different approaches here. Um, it's not only me talking today. I've been working and selling Agile for more than 10 years, um, but I've been also been on the other side of the table. I've been also buying projects back in the day. Um, and I've been talking to a number of different people about these same challenges. So um, this time I didn't bring anyone live here for, for interviews, but I did record a number of different videos. Um, so for example, uh, this guy here, he's, he's uh, Perttu Tolvanen. Um, he's a professional web buyer. So the only thing he does for a customer, he goes, goes to a customer, helps them to find a vendor, helps them to, to, to go through an RFP process and so on and so on. So, uh, one of the questions I asked from him is like, how, do, how should vendors actually sell Agile because this is all he does, day in and day out. Um, so this interview was done in, in our uh, office in Helsinki. So um, ignore the office doc that you know, jumps into the video every now and then. We have quite a few office docs and this stuff happens when you try recording stuff. Be a 
Right. So this is really the, the core of what I'm going to talk about today as well. It's really like you don't want to sell Agile. You want to sell the actual benefits of Agile. Um, this, is, this is where we'll be getting at. So um, I'm, I'm, I do attend quite a few Agile conferences every year. And, and I talk about the same topics um, with, with different people in Agile conferences as well. And usually when I ask them, like, do you have any problems in selling Agile, they say, like, no, not really, because, you know, everybody wants Agile these days. We used to have problems with this, but that's no longer the case. Um, this is not exactly true in, in the Drupal universe, unfortunately, um, but everybody still kind of wants Agile. Um, so let me start by um, assuring you that Agile is really simple, but it, it's not easy. Like we did, a, we did an Agile training uh, yesterday in here um, for, for a classroom full of people. You can actually teach something like Scrum in a day. The basic principles you can even learn in half an hour, hour. It is, it is really, really simple. But it's quite difficult to actually switch to Agile because it's a change of a mindset. It's, it's not so much about like, you know, what you, what you actually do. It's more about how do you approach on, on, on your projects and how does your, your organization think. Um, so that's why it's definitely not easy. So the starting point, of course, is like everybody, everybody loves Agile on its own. Uh, but if you, if you ask them, like, well, what, what, what do you mean by Agile? What it is? It's very, very misunderstood on what Agile is, is actually all about. It's a bit easier to explain what it's not about. So Agile is definitely not about implementation. It doesn't have anything to do with, with implementing software on its own. You can use it for that, yes, but it's not really all about that. Um, it's not about doing sprints or stand-ups or having burn down charts or any of that. It's, it's not really that. Um, it's not even pure time and materials always. It's like you can do Agile with a fixed budget. That's fine. That's perfectly OK. You just can't do fixed everything if you want to do Agile. And also, Agile is not going to be magic. It's not going to magically fix all of your problems. It's just going to make them more visible. It's going to give you some tools on how to fix those problems. But just you know, going Agile, that's not going to fix your problems on its own. So let me go a bit deeper on this. So I, I take it quite a few of you. Who, who hasn't seen this? Nobody dares to, to <laughs> raise their hand. Uh, so this is the Agile Manifesto. Festa. This is from 2001. A uh, bunch of people getting together on, on putting down some values on, on how to do proper software development, because a uh, lot of software projects tend to fail. Um, I went, to, I, I went to university and studied computer sciences back in the 90s, and I can remember um, we were taught like something like 80-90% of software projects fail. It's like, okay, thank you. Very nice studying here and you know, learning that everything that I'm going to do is very likely to fail. Uh, and, and this used to be the case, and it still is. You can always read from papers on, on all of these like massive IT projects that go wrong. Um, but there are ways of, of, you know, making that risk smaller. It's not going to guarantee success, but there are ways of doing that. That's what this is all about. It's all about, like, let's focus on individuals and interactions over processes and tools and so on. Um, I'm not going to go into all of the, all of the details here. Uh, these are the core principles behind Agile, though. And, and they sound great, don't they? It, you know, all of it makes sense. It's perfectly sensible to respond to change over following a plan. Um, but there's, there's always the but. And, 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 and a brilliant individual created this. This is a manifesto for half-assed agile software development. And this is what we see. And this is what, what most companies call agile, unfortunately. So, so this is like uh, what it says down there. Uh, items on the left sound nice in theory, but you know, us being an enterprise company, we, we, we can't let go on the things on the right. So it's going to be like individuals and interactions over processes and tools, and we have mandatory processes and tools uh, on controlling those individuals, blah, blah, blah. Um, and they, this is what happens. So th this is where you go wrong, because if you really want to do the, the sort of take the leap and go agile, <laughs> it's also all about letting go of some of these things. If you just try to get like best of waterfall and agile and do everything, you're not going to get benefits from, from either one of these. Um, so this is, this is what I call fake Agile, usually, 
or fragile some cases as well. Uh, but it, it's, it's completely faking. It's just, you know, um, having your, your waterfall process and putting sprints on top of it. It's not going to do, it's not going to make the process agile. You may get some benefit from the sprints, but you're not actually getting the core benefits of, of the agile process. So why this happens? Um, my analysis on this is, um, looks like this more or less. Um, for, for agile, there's two primary things. One of them is trust. One of them is communication. So obviously up and right is more of both in this diagram. So um, if you have a lot of trust and you have perfect communication, what do you have? You, you have an in-house team. The trust is implicit because everybody works for the same company. Everybody is in the same room, so you have very rich communications. Uh, what's the, the other like extreme? That would be like external vendor, a new one, an offshore one, where you mostly communicate by emails, by you know people having interesting accents and different cultures, and all in all, the communication may not be all that great. And in between, of course, you have vendor that is co-located, where communication works, but the trust is implicitly not there. It's, it's, you know, you have to build the trust. Or, or of course, you can have a distributed in-house team where you have the communication problems, but the trust is there. So um, what it looks like, the traditional agile is really built for, for the, the in-house teams. Um, Scrum, for example, it's meant for product development done by in-house teams. Everybody sitting in the same room. That's what it's for. Um, it can be used for everything else as well. Uh, but if you have a vendor working in-house, co-located vendor, you're going to have problems with these lovely people at procurement departments and, and legal departments, uh, my two favorite departments in any enterprise company, uh, always so, so nice to work with um, and flexible. Um, so so that's, that's what you'll have, um, and, and that's what's causing you some problems. Uh, if you have a distributed team, regardless of where they're at, you have communication and knowledge management problems with Agile. Um, you don't have the documentation and you don't have the comps in place, so you end up having some problems with that. And if you start Agile with having an offshoring vendor, you, that's going to be very challenging. I'm not going to say it's impossible. But I'm just going to say you are def definitely picking the, the most challenging way of, of starting your like agile journey. And I know because we, we, we have 170 people doing Drupal all over Europe. Um, so we have our fair share of distributed teams, not offshore. Everybody can fly and meet the customer within like one or two hours. The flights are cheap and short. <laughs> but still we do do a fair bit of distributed. So we've seen this a lot. Um, so of course, you know, our way of fixing this is, is making airlines like us a lot by, by you know, flying on site and, and, and spending time with the customer. But the trust, trust issue is much more difficult to solve. So, so if there's no trust, there's not going to be any proper agile. Because in place of trust, you start putting in contracts and the contracts start defining everything. And yeah, I'll get back to that in, in some of my examples. So. Um, do we have any, any questions so far? That we do. Yeah, we have a couple of questions in, or a couple of points. Um, let's take one for now. Grab Tindy has tweeted uh, and says, do you find there is a minimum scale for a successful Agile project, and does the approach change depending on scale? For example, working in thematic sprints versus deployable horizontal slices. That's an excellent question, yes. Um, you can use Agile for all sizes but you can't use, for example, Scrum for all sizes. Um, in the end, if you look at Scrum, a sprint is a waterfall. That's what it is. Um, and, and if you do only one sprint, it's kind of fake to call it Agile. It's like, come on, this is Scrum. It's like, no, no, it's a waterfall project, really. Uh, but you can use like uh, lean methods, you can use Kanban, you can use others like that for smaller projects. Uh, when you scale up, there's, there's no definite upper limit, limit for using something like Scrum. But that said, if, if a project is big enough, you want to start splitting it into multiple teams. And, and then you have all the difficulties that, that you get with, with managing multiple teams, but that's a bit of scope for today. And uh, that's, for, uh, that's okay for now, but if you want more questions, tweet hash selling agile. Thank you, Steve. All right.
So uh, moving on, moving on how to actually sell this stuff. Um, I do this a lot and, and I fail a lot in this. I, I succeed quite a bit as well. Um, but so let's, let's get back to, to our story for, uh, for a while. Um, so what did we do with, with this vendor, uh, sorry, this customer? Uh, we, we sort of, we started working with them and, and said like, okay, um, you know, let's, let's put a lot more support in place than you usually have. And, and let's think about for a while. You are saying you always fail with vendors. Let's think about an example from, from your normal daily life. All of us, I'm sure, have a friend who's, who's less successful in relationships. I think everybody has one. Uh, so what do they often say? They say that all men or women are so horrible. You know, I just can't make it work. All of them are so bad. So what's the one single thing that doesn't change in all of your relationships? Well, yeah, yourself. Look at, look at, look at the mirror. That's what I told the customer. Are all of your vendors always failing with all the other customers? No, you know, they're still in business. They do succeed. So why do you think they are always failing with you? Well, that got them thinking. <laughs> um, they were a bit more willing to, to get in some extra overheads and some extra support after that. So basically, getting a customer to realize what the problem is all about is, is, is a good start. So have a look. let's have a look at the, the benefits then. Uh, these are four key benefits of Agile. Um, the red line being Agile, black line being um, waterfall or design first, any other methodology where you do your design first and implement in implementation later. Um, so I just typically call them design first, all of these methodologies. So of course in Agile you have visib quite a bit more visibility because traditionally you when you start, you have perfect visibility. You think you know what you're doing because your plans are perfect and you have perfect visibility, right? Then it goes to black hole where you don't know anything and something may or may not come out at the other end. Uh, in Agile, same thing happens, but all the time. So you sort of you plan, you implement, you deploy something. So visibility is much better. Adaptability. In Agile, we can change stuff all the time. So the project is much more adaptive, adaptable to, to change uh, during, you know, in the environment or in the organization or what have you. Business value. Uh, in Agile, we work the highest value items first. So we deliver the maximum value right away. Uh, in, in traditional, we do everything in one big bang, more or less. We may have multiple releases, but we still we need to do everything before we can release. Um, so the business value generation, if you stop the project in the middle, it looks very different. Risk-wise, risk is sort of a mirror image of, of the business value because when we start delivering value, the risk goes down. Simple as that. So these are sort of the four key elements, but I'm, I'm going to go a bit deeper with some case examples. So I think, because more than half of the room is, is vendors, I think you've seen most of these with your customers at some point. So first one is the, the famous fixed scope. like. Yeah, sure, of course. All of the customers always say, of course we can do Agile, not a problem. That's fine. But you know, I, I need to have a fixed budget and fixed scope and fixed timeline and fixed everything. After that we can do Agile. Yeah, not a problem. Well, let's have a look at this. Let's compare for a while. So first of all, um, where do we focus if we have a, a fixed scope where uh, most customers think they are protecting their own backsides by, by having a, a fixed scope? Um, in a fixed bit, the, the, the vendor really focuses on, on checking all of the boxes. There are some requirements, and these requirements need, need to be met. And if you meet them really quickly and cheaply, you are making a massive profit. If you take a while with them, you are not really making any profits. So um, it really is all about checking the boxes with, with minimum effort with, with fixed bit. Um, Agile, on the other hand, it is time and materials. So your incentive is to create as much value as you can for the customer with the time you spend. Um, you focus on the results and you can also focus on the total cost of ownership instead of one of cost of a project. Scope, well, fixed bid is fixed. Changes are going to be expensive. There's change uh, management in place and, and customer will pay for all of these changes. 
Uh, on the other hand, on Agile, of course, you know, it's built for being flexible and, and you know, it's built for change. And do you have a question at this point? I was just going to wait a moment, but okay. that, now you ask. Yes, Anthony Lindsay uh, asks specifically in this area, uh, how can you marry Agile with a fixed price traditional request for a tender? So if the customer is demanding the fixed, how can you marry Agile to that request, given it's in their best interests? Um, yes, you can do it actually quite easily. As long as the customer can be flexible on the scope, fixed pri price is perfectly fine. Um, so what you can do is you can do very high-level promises on we are going to deliver this and this business goal. We are going to meet with this project. You know, we are going to do what we can. The actual specific scope itself, that needs to be flexible. So what we do often to, to meet the uh, requirements of, of legal and procurement is like the contract actually says like this is the initial backlog for the project. This is the scope. That makes legal people happy. They are all smiling at this point. And then it says, and the steering group of the of the project may change this at any point, and you know it's it's going to keep on changing. And the steering group is like participants from from the customer and vendor, and as long as they agree, they can do whatever with it. So basically, you have all of this. Um, ideally, you wouldn't even have it in a contract, but in real world, when you work with enterprise level customers, you kind of have to put it in there. Uh, you just leave in a loophole to to be able to change it. That's the easiest way I've, I've figured out how to do it. That usually works. Uh, because typically, in my experience, if, if you have a customer who has an idea and knows what they are doing, it's the actual sales game is like you and customer against the procurement, unfortunately. Because the procurement is just saying like, no, no, we can't do this because we were trained, it, trained to do it differently. Um, it is unfortunate, and I think procurement needs to change, but that's not the topic for today. <laughs> so, was there something else? That's all for okay, great. Um, so the risk. Um, in fixed bid, uh, risk is largely hidden. So, so what, what the customer is trying to do in a fixed bid, you're trying to move the risk to the vendor by having contracts and sanctions and what have you. And, and that's like, eh, you can try to do it, but it's not very easy, and, and often you can't even do it. Uh, in Agile, it's much more transparent, and, and parties actually share the risk. It's transparent on how the risk is shared, who has what part of the risk, and so on. It's, it's quite, quite different. Let me do an example. Um, let's say I'm, I'm a customer who, who I, I need to transfer 20 bags of rice every day, I need to transfer them, say, like five kilometers or five miles. doesn't make a lot of difference for this example. Um, and I need to be able to transfer them, say, in an hour. And, you know, so I, I, I define these requirements. I have all of these checkboxes that, you know, you have to meet these and these and these requirements. And I'll make up ten more just, you know, to be on the safe side. And then I think, okay, I've covered all of the requirements. So now I'm going to send out an RFP and I'm just going to, basically pick the cheapest because, you know, hey, I'm completely safe. I, my requirements are going to be my, my safety net, right? This is what happens in IT projects all the time. So what, what, what do I get as, as a customer? What's the expectation? I'm going to get a lorry or something like that, right? That, that's my expectation. Well, this is what comes up. It's the cheapest possible thing that does the trick. You're going to hate to use it. It's going to break down. Every other day you can't actually get the bags delivered because it breaks down and you have a lot of downtime. But it checks all the boxes. So you can't blame the vendor. So all of these traditional requirements you have in, in RFPs, they are very, very good at covering the backside of the vendor. Not great at covering the backside of the, of the customer. So actually, the traditional approach, of, of especially for IT projects, it, it completely turns on its head, turns on its head. It's, it's like, it's not good for the customer, especially if you look at like very large IT companies. They're very good at playing this game as well. So the customer is never going to be happy and they're going to be very profitable in these projects. And in almost all cases, the vendor has more competence in playing this game than the customer does. So, um, also there's this. This is a real picture. It's, it's from construction industry, I think. So the big yacht there, it's called, uh, called the change order. 
and the small thing is is um, original contract. And and it's it's kind of funny because that's the way it is in real life. For for IT companies, the change orders in traditional fixed everything contracts, those are the most profitable part. So they are very good at change management because that's where they make their money. And this is when the projects are millions and millions. This is this is where it's headed. Um, not many customers understand it, and they still they try to protect themselves. So as a vendor, it's it's up to you to try to explain to the customers like, look, you are not really protecting yourself. And even if you try, it's it it becomes a game, and it's a game that is very difficult to to actually win for you. So in this case, um, if we use Agile, uh, we'll be creating more value, we'll be managing the risk better, and, and we, can, we can have a lower total cost of ownership because we can focus on that instead of focusing on just checking the boxes. At uh, that point, a good point to introduce a question from Anand, who says, isn't Fixed Beard a better alternative to time and materials for some projects with uncertain scope, therefore the vendors absorb the delivery risks? Well, this comes down to like... If it's an uncertain scope, actually, I'll, I'll table that for a minute. I'll get back to this because I do have an example on, on the risk. So I'll, I'll get back to this in a second. Um, right. So the second quite typical case is not having a product owner. Product owner is the person who's, who's sort of the project manager on the customer side, the, the business owner of, of um, the project. So. Let's say you have a customer who has just documentation and mock-ups and so on, and they just they throw them out basically and say, "You you go do it. We've we've done our part. So you know we are going to go out on a holiday or whatever." Uh, in Europe, they would go on a holiday. In in America, you know, they go and work on other projects, of course. But the same same concept applies, of course. <laughs> so we have our vacations. <laughs> um, so still, you know, we we've seen this. So. What we do in, in, in all the projects uh, with Wunder is um, we really we create like one team where um, instead of just having the digital and, and project competence we have, uh, we combine that with the, with the business competence of customer. So first of all, when this team together works on these things, it, they, can, they can come up with new ideas and they can improve on the original you know, ideas quite a bit. So, so the end result is much better. It's like having a, a in-house digital team for a customer. So this is the first thing. It's, it's actually the end result is likely to be better. Then the planning. When we do it just in time, this is how, how it looks traditionally, right? Uh, we plan and analyze and design, and, and you know, then we let the code monkeys loose at some point, and you know, they go and code it, and then it's tested and released, right? So we don't really save on any of these steps when we're doing Agile. It doesn't mean no planning. We still do all the same steps. We need to do a bit of initial design first, um, but we do it in, in, in different, different phases. So we do the design just in time. So if somebody tells you that you're going to be saving time on design when you do Agile, they don't know what they're talking about. It's actually quite the opposite. You may end up spending a bit more time on design, but you're not wasting time on doing design for stuff which may not en end up being implemented at all. So let's see if, if there's a, let's imagine for a while that there, there was a project where both budget runs out or time runs out. This naturally never happens, but if, if there were such a project and, and you run out of time in here, what's gonna happen with your, your traditional no product owner approach? You have something that is like mostly coded not tested at all, and not ready for release, and not released definitely. With Agile, we did like the most valuable things first. So the 50% 50 50 of the project is actually already released or ready to release. Rest of it, not done. We can decide to continue and, and do it. Or if we really have to wrap the project up at this point, that's what we do. We still we got most of the valuable stuff out of the way. So this is this is uh, where we need the product owner. We really need the product owner to make the decisions on what's what, what are the most important parts of this project. Um, so this this actually leads into lowering the risk quite a bit. It also leads into having better quality out of the project because we put our money where where it makes the biggest difference instead of just trying to check all the boxes in a project. And in the end, it also leads often for, for saving money. So, 
Third case, um, delayed feedback in a project. Uh, quite often, if, if we try to do a big bang launch, big bang launch, which is which is like a typical way of launching design first projects. So basically, you go in a dark room and then you come out with something and ta-da, that's you know there we go. We can we can launch it now. Uh, typically, we do testing quite late in a project. Typically, we don't allow real users or, or beta users in the product quite quite early. Um, and this has some negative, pretty negative effects. First of these being, um, let's, let's think about the line in the middle being the optimal version of what we want to launch. Uh, going up means doing too much, spending too much time on, on details, for example. Going down means not having good enough version of a feature, for example. Well, in time, if we only get the customer feedback or, or the end user feedback once, we may actually deviate quite a bit from what's optimal before we know it. Whereas in Agile, where we launch often and launch early, we get feedback all the time, so we actually we end up going back and forth. It's, it's still not going to be optimal all the time, but we will not end up deviating during the entire project and only after, after building something that looks perfect launching it. It's like, oh, it doesn't work. And this is, this is very, very important because with Agile you can, you can get stuff out early, you can get feedback on it, you can improve it, you can make sure it's, it's really great for your users. Investment-wise, it also makes much more sense. So um, if, if we, for a while, if we assume we are playing a, a lottery with, with three balls, um, and, and there's two ways of playing this. The first way is the traditional way where a ticket costs three euros, you pay it, you win or you don't win. That's the way it goes. The second way of paying it is, is just buying one number for one euro. And only after you know if it's a winning number, investing to the next number, and so on. And if you do the math on this, um, what the average investment is over, over a lifespan of a company, or five or ten years, or doing like thousand projects, what do you think the, the average investment on a successful project is going to be? It feels like this is sort of like, in a real project, doesn't make a big difference. But if you um, want to go and Google like real options theory, for example, um, which is like a theory on how to do, how to take like options in your real business development. This is exactly what it enables when you do Agile. You can do smaller chunks of work when you know if they work or not, then you can do additional investment. So your, your investment decisions are going to be done with the latest responsible moment. So this makes a massive difference for many organizations, yet not enough organizations do this. But again, as vendors, we can tell them, like, try to explain them why it's a good idea, why should they invest just in time, not, not everything up front. So basically, this, this leads us to, into having some real options on business development, learning much faster and, and much more cost-effective solutions. Did we have a question? We do. Uh, David Stephen uh, says, uh, if customer's not happy with output with fixed bid and fixed scope, um, how to get more budget when it won't guarantee better output? Uh, sorry, with flexible scope, yes. Yeah. That makes more sense. Customer not happy with output with fixed bid uh, and flexible scope. How can you get more budget when it won't guarantee better output? You won't. Uh, what, what happens with if you want to do proper agile, which is mostly time and materials, it, it doesn't have to be pure time and materials, but it's mostly. What you have to guarantee for the customer is an option of kicking you out. So basically, if you start working, your contract says, like, if you're not happy, for what, what we produce, like the, the result for your spent money you get, you can kick us out. So it goes two ways. The customer has to trust you, but you have to trust the customer. So in all of our contracts, we say, like, you can fire us at any point. If you're not happy, what you get. And when we do project steering, we make it really visible. This is what you got. This is the money you paid. Are you happy on it? And in most projects, at some point, the customer is not going to be happy because we do stuff like integrations, which is completely not visible. And it's like, uh, well, we don't really have anything to show and you just spent like 50,000 euros. <laughs> um, but that's sort of a temporary thing. 
uh, in, in technical projects and you can explain yourself out of that situation. So it's, it's not a massive problem. But if you continue doing it and not delivering value, I think you deserve to get fired at that point. Fair enough. You know, customer trusted you and you were not delivering, so out you go. Right. Um, so then the, the famous design first, and now I'm talking a bit more like visual design first and, and such things. Um, but this also applies for, for legal for some companies because um, some companies say that our industry, for example, has so much regulation that everything has to be approved by legal before we build anything. And, and then I talk, talk to people like New York Stock Exchange, which say they do exclusively agile and they, design, they don't design anything up front. I think their industry is pretty regulated. That's just my guess. So, so it's really only an excuse and, and you know, being used to one way of working. You, you don't have to do like visual designs or, or legal checks up front. You can actually build them into the agile process. It just requires different way of thinking. So let's, let's see if we do design first. Oh, and by the way, we do the same thing when, when companies approach us and ask like, uh, as part of your proposal, would you like to do like visual mockups? No, because this is what the project looks like and this is any project. So uh, down we have time and, and left hand side we have knowledge. So in the beginning of the project, any project, the team has minimum knowledge of the project, right? pretty common sense. At the end of it, we have maximum amount of knowledge. So that's where, where the hindsight is a beautiful thing. Um, so when do we do all of the most important decisions in the project? If we have all the requirements in an RFP, we do them with the minimum knowledge, right? So we always tell to the customers, for example, when talking about uh, like uh, visuals, that we don't want to do any of this with minimal knowledge. We do have a agile design process in place for a very good reason. And our own designers absolutely love it because they get to do design decisions with knowing much, much more about the topic and the project and the end user. Um, so sort of when you show this to customers, this is kind of like, yeah, okay, it is what it is. Of course, you can't make all the decisions at the end because the project is over at that point, but you can postpone all of, all of the key decisions to the latest responsible moment. Of course, responsible is the key word here because if you, if you just postpone all the decisions all the time, uh, it's worse than, than not deciding at all. Drupal specific thing. With Drupal, uh, features are cheap and details are expensive. Because, you know, in the end, what do we do as, as Drupal shops? We take a fully functional product and we spend the project in trying to break it. Uh, we are pretty good at it. We typically, we manage to break Drupal pretty well as well. Um, so when, when you spend most of your time in, in details in projects, does it make any sense to fix all of those up front? In, in, in worst case, having a designer who has no idea how Drupal works, designing something, and then we just spend a lot of time trying to code it to look like somebody who has no idea how Drupal works. Drupal has like existing user interfaces, you know. If we want to save a lot of money for the customer, we have to consider these user interfaces a bit while doing design. There's, there's something called Pareto Principle that is, has nothing to do with technology. It's from economics that states that about 80% of value you get for 20% of time. This applies for any project. For Drupal projects, I would say 95% of, of the value you get for 5% of the time and rest of it you are tweaking on the details. So when you are tweaking on the, let's say, visual details, you are actually tweaking them on customer money. It's, it's not the designer's money. And it's, it's if, if there's an external design agency, it's not certainly not the design agency's money because the design agency wants to win awards. The customer wants to do business. So, so basically, it's up to the product owner to decide on how much tweaking we do with, with any details. And this very much is true. The last, like, 50% or more, almost always is something that only sort of the in-house team even notices any difference on. So that's why... For example, we have our own prototype-driven process where, where we can offer multiple options on like, we know this is what we are trying to do, and, and we could do this in, in like an hour with an existing Drupal feature. It's not exactly what you asked for, but it's kind of the same thing. Or we can spend a week doing exactly what you asked. It's your money. You decide. It's not our decision. 
it's yours. And quite often customers, they pick the cheaper way. Not always. So um, we end up with improved product, risk lower, and, and also we generate with new ideas when we don't do designs up front. Right, so now we get back to the risk question. Um, this is quite typical uh, from, from customers to say, like, we expect you to carry the, the project risk because, you know, we have contracts in place that are going to transfer the risk for you, and we have a lot of uncertainty in this project, so we want you to carry the risk for us. Really? How realistic is that? If you have a look at, like, can you even transfer that business risk? Like, if you are late to the market, you lose a lot of revenues. If there's damage to your brand because everything crashes, because, you know, somebody skimmed on the quality, or, you know, a number of other things. You can have some clauses saying you have to pay some money back for these, but they are probably not going to compensate you for it. Or if they will, that insurance is going to be really, really expensive for you. Or in a worst case, you may be dealing with the vendor who has no idea on how to do their business. And I don't know which one is more scary. <laughs> is it more scary to know that this like transfer of risk is not going to happen or knowing that you have a vendor who's incompetent? So I don't think you can actually do it. Also, the traditional way of, of doing uh, procurement is sort of like win-lose. It's, it's based on procurement being a game, and, and in a game you have winners and losers. How often in real life do you see like um, win-lose relationships working for, for, for longer run? They may work initially for you, but on longer run the person who's losing in this relationship is looking to get out. And if, if a customer is just looking for a vendor to lose in a relationship, yeah, you know, the vendor may do it to get a reference or, you know, to fix cash flow for a minute or whatever, but the vendor is not going to be there for a longer run unless they can fix the relationship. So instead of trying to win, uh, it would be much, much better to try to look for a relationship which is like equal and, and actually, you know, works for both parties as well. Um, so that's, that's sort of the big difference. Um, and and we, fortunately, we see more and more companies these days, like large companies, looking to find like really healthy relationships where it's really transparent on like what do we get out of it. We are transparent about our margins and everything and explain like what's, what makes a difference for our margins, how can you help us to do better business so we can also, you know, help you to do better business. So transparency is the, is the best policy. One practical example uh, on this pricing what you can do, for example, you can do target pricing for a contract. Like, look, this is, this is the price we are aiming for, and then we have the maximum price for a contract. If we manage to deliver under the target price, we get a 20% bonus on what's remaining. Customer gets a really big discount, but this discount is only happening because the customer product owner was smart on setting priorities and, and enabled us to do work quickly and, and not get hung up on all the details. On the other hand, if we go over the maximum budget, we give, say, 40% discount on everything that is done over the maximum price. Something like 40%, 50% is, is typically, in, in our industry, that's where, where we are no longer making any money. So this is really, really bad for us to end up in this situation. But it's, it's not for free for the customer. It needs to hurt both parties if, if this happens, because there also has to be an incentive on getting out of this situation. Um, so, if you want to have a look at, like, how to build this sort of situations, just Google for, like, agile contract models. There are quite a few good models on how to do fair contracts that work well for both customer and, and the vendor. This is just, just one example, really. A question in from Grab Tindy. Uh, he says, uh, are you willing to give up quality standards if a customer is unwilling to pay for details following initial development? It's customer money. It's, it's not our money. So um, the, the most common uh, way of running into this is a developer saying, like, no, we have to do it the triple way. And the triple way may be instead of 10 minutes, we spend two weeks or something, unfortunately. Um, and in these cases, it's not the developer's money. It's the customer's money. So we explain to the customer, this is going to come back and it's going to bite you in the behind because, you know, when you are maintaining this, it's more expensive. But look, you know, as long as the customer understands 
It may be in some cases the customer doesn't care all that much. Like, okay, lifespan of this thing is going to be a year. It's not worth investing and doing it the right way. So, yeah, if, if the customer demands it and if the customer understands the, the decision they are making, it's their money. It's not ours. Right. Um, so, I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but there's, um, there's something we can learn from construction industry, believe it or not. <laughs> it's not the most dynamic industry you can think of. So, this is Terminal 5 in Heathrow uh, in London. And um, they build it, built a new terminal a few years ago for about three, four billion pounds. So, you know, a fairly large amount of money for, for a building project. And, and they knew that most projects on this scale end up going horribly wrong, like just completely over budget and behind schedule and everything. So what they did for this is they researched all of the mega projects of this size in UK during the past 10 years. And they figured out like, you know, what are the common things and how to do this differently. And, and they came up with a completely different model of, of not trying to pass off all the risk to the vendors, but actually having a model where we split the risk and, and sort of much, much more like healthy relationship kind of a contract. And it just turns out, you know, they managed to do it right on budget and, and on time and so on. There are still some problems with it. And if you go and do some research online on this, there's some critique on it. But it's actually a good read to go online and, and check the Terminal 5 contract model and what was behind it. Because as an industry, like, we could actually really learn something from, from construction industry, which I wouldn't have imagined before I run into to this case. But live and learn. So uh, in this case, we can get uh, more sustainable relationships, first of all, something that lasts a long time, good for both parties, uh, risk management, and, and also better quality of life for everybody. When it's like a good, fair relationship, everybody enjoys their working life a bit more. Nobody likes being in an abusing relationship, not even at work. Um, so that, that's if you want to retain all of your employees, that becomes a, a pretty important thing. So I spoke also to James Kutz, who's, who's a um, sort of director for all the product implementations and, and uh, big on Agile in, in NBC Universal. So he sort of introduced Agile to, to NBC Universal. So um, I asked him, what, what does he actually ask for, like when, when he's looking for Agile vendors on how does the RFP process go, so that as a vendor you have better idea on what the customer is thinking. So let's hear James. Sure, yeah. I, I think, um, so I, don't, I don't have a real work set of work group, but what I try to do is really get the vendor to share what their experience is. And I find any vendor who is using some form of agile or has that experience, they're, they're very passionate about it um, and willing to share. And they usually have some, some type of presentation that they're so really excited to share. Uh, so, you know, that's one of the first things I do is just get them to, to share, ask them, you know, what is your experience with that? Tell me about your processes. Give me examples. How have you done this? And usually, organizations, vendors that are that are um, have experience with that or are really are passionate and they're really willing to share um, that information. Uh, it, it's you know when that conversation is quiet, the response is quiet and it becomes uncomfortable. Then you then you know that that vendor probably doesn't have you know um, the best experience there. But I find you know, when you're, when you're interviewing vendors and, and talking to them, those that have the experience are usually pretty excited to share it when they ask. So, um, you know, I always say just ask. And I couldn't agree more with, with James on this. It's, this is what you hear over and over again. You need to trust your own process in order to sell it. If you have an agile process and you fully don't trust it, you're not going to be able to sell it. I understand it's a chicken and egg kind of situation if you're moving to Agile, but you have to start small then. Uh, on exactly that point, Chris Rooney has a question. He says, Agile requires high trust from the client on budget, timeline, and goals. So how can you create that trust with brand new clients? If, if a customer is, is brand new to Agile, uh, you have to start small. That's the only thing you can do. It. You, can, you, can, you need to show them small wins. Uh, initially, you have to take a bit of risk yourself. Uh, and, and I wouldn't, if, if you as a company are new to Agile, I wouldn't go and sell Agile to customers who are new to Agile, unless it's an existing customer with existing trust relationship in place. 
I would rather sell Agile to customers who are used to doing Agile. And I would also be pretty honest about, like, you don't have loads of Agile experience yet, but if you can sell your team otherwise, and if they are experienced in Agile, it may be beneficial relationship still for, for both of you. So um, same thing and ask also from, from, from Berto about this, so let's see what he says. Oh, sorry. Right. All right. So do we have any, any other questions at this point? Or? Uh, one uh, from Anand, uh, again, says, uh, is there a case to split the product management and project management roles in the vendor's team? Uh, aren't the two contradictory? Um, that may be uh, slightly <laughs> off scope for this session, but um, I probably wouldn't. I would try to keep it as one thing, but... That said, if, if, if you have a product portfolio that is being run with Agile, uh, then you need to have like Agile portfolio management and all that. But we can talk about that, that afterwards, I guess, because that's quite detailed. All right. Um, so what if, you know, after all of this, the, the customer is still saying like, you know, we want to have fixed everything. And um, let me do an example of this, like um, about... One and a half years ago, a year ago, we, we had a um, large global media company approaching us with an RFP that was a completely fixed everything RFP. So they were saying like, okay, you know, we would like to work with you guys. We've heard nice things about you, but you know, this is this is our approach. So we sent them a, a short reply on saying no thanks. We explained them what's wrong, what's likely to go wrong with with their approach and say that they basically told them in like four or five pages that these are the problems you will have with the approach you've, you've taken. So just told them no. We got a reply uh, in a day. They were quite swift. The reply was like, thank you, you have been shortlisted. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, so, so it just happened that we explained what had happened with all of their previous projects or quite a few of them. Um, and they were willing to listen. So we got in, uh, we, we spoke with them, we explained their problems, their approach and all that, and, and they, you know, said like, okay, fine, let's start working together and, and let's, let's do a different project. Uh, we, we've done now a couple of, of um, large projects for them and they've been just fine. Um, actually, the product owner on the customer end who, who took the risk and, and chose us and, and worked with us, uh, got a big, massive promotion also afterwards after the first project, so it went pretty well. So now we have a very good cheerleader in this organization saying like, no, no, all of this should go agile. So you can take a few different approaches. First of all, if you get a, a fixed everything RFP, you can just say no, walk away. It's cheap, it's easy, uh, it's quick to do, you know, no harm done. Uh, but of, of course, you know, you don't, you don't learn much. And, and the customer doesn't learn anything. Then you can do the second thing that we do usually. We say no. We also explain them why we don't do it. We explain them what's probably going to go wrong. We try to be brief, so we're not going to send them books or anything, but explain it. Um, sometimes it goes wrong, and, and the customer just says, like, oh, okay, no, no, we need to do it our way. 
sometimes what I just explained happens. Customer comes back and say, says like, okay, let's talk. We've, we've seen these problems you are describing, so what's your solution to this? Um, and then you can do the, the desperate thing and say like, okay, well, I'm just going to offer a fixed scope contract and try to do Agile within it. That's nasty. Um, you can try to do it, but then, then sort of you are trying to give all of the nice things to the customer and at the same time uh, take all the risk to yourself. And, and that's not very healthy long-term business. Um, I know you can do it and I know you can succeed in it, uh, but I, I personally I wouldn't. Uh, we've, we've sort of built a company around Agile from day one and we've never done anything else than Agile. So for us it's quite easy to say that just decline everything that is not Agile. Uh, but, you know, having run about 20 years of different professional services companies, I understand it's challenging if, if you can't, you know, pay your salaries. <laughs> it's going to be a bit of a challenge to decline and say no. Um, but uh, if you want to, you know, end up on a more healthy, profitable uh, business and more happy employees on, on longer run, I would decline these one way or the other. This is also one of my motivations of on, on talking about this topic quite often, especially in, in, in the Drupal community. I think this would be best for, for everybody. If all of the really good shops would start saying no to fixed everything proposals, would be great for the customers. They would need to move to Agile sooner. They would only have the really crappy shops, you know, doing fixed everything and failing badly with that. Would be great with shops as well, because, you know, more and more shops would be able to move to, to fully Agile ways of doing business. So I think this would be really good for, for everybody. And I know more and more companies do this as well. It's a perfectly valid, uh, valid uh, approach. Try it. So, uh, getting, back to, getting back to the original story, what actually happened? Um, uh, that went pretty much like, like you could expect. We, we told the customer that we are going to add a lot of additional support uh, for, for their teams. And, and there's a lot of extra overhead for this. So we actually had a couple of agile coaches there and all sorts of things. Um, they really, really tried hard to struggle against going to Agile. They still tried to uh, run around in circles, basically. When, you know, when their media sales sold something, they tried to just push it, you know, as a first thing and do a new project and, and do really, like, unhealthy practices uh, around all sorts of things and just design everything up front still. Um, so we helped them internally say no a lot. Uh, and, and in the end, what happened is like they, they started succeeding in their projects after, after about six months. After a year, they started succeeding with other vendors as well. Now it's been four or five years. We, we work with them a lot. They are one of our largest customers today. And, and almost all of their digital projects these days are successful. So it was only a shift of mindset on how they, how they actually you know, go about and, and procure projects and how they treat their, their vendors and all this. But it, it really took years. Uh, it took a lot of work and, and most of the credit, of course, is, is, is to them. I only take the credit on, on helping them to get on the right path and, you know, rest of it then was, was all them. So that's where the credit should go. So that's really all I have and I think I'm almost about time as well. So if we have a last question, we can, we can still take that one. And there's no more on Twitter at the moment, but if um, anyone wants to tweet or step up to the mic, I think we've got time for one question before the deadline. Yeah, we have 30 seconds. <laughs> so any, any last questions? <laughs> nope. We can continue on Twitter. Thank you, everybody. Or, or you can come afterwards here. Oh, and please remember to evaluate the session. I always forgot about this part. So. Thank you.